Okay, so uh, sorry, I I changed the order uh, uh, unintentionally. <laughs> I I didn't mean to give any preference to material science. <laughs> I was just writing it out of my memory. Uh, right. So, uh, uh, well, my name is Kirill Chetnichenko. I'm a, uh, I'm I'm a, a reader at the University of Bath, and uh, well, my interests are in uh, well in these subjects. Uh, at the moment, I work mostly on applications of analysis to material science. Well, or rather, on an, uh, on problems in analysis that are motivated by problems in material science. But uh, as as may actually be uh, become clear, following and hopefully become clear after this uh, series of lectures, uh, the two areas are quite closely intertwined. Right. So there is. Um, there is a, a great deal of similarity between uh, the equations that appear in Oh, okay. Uh, Okay, so there is. Um, so I think I think there has been a realization over the last uh, uh, few years that um, that a lot of the tools and techniques that have been developed as part of the uh, as part of the subject of mathematical physics and the analytical component of it, as described by uh, uh, by Ricardo Vedder. Yeah, gracias. Mm -hmm. Is. Uh, uh, can, is actually applicable to uh, to those equations that that emerge that appear in uh, that are motivated by material science. So, and I will start with some uh, examples, some motivating examples that well will hopefully illustrate that the equations are very similar. But um, my principal sort of uh, application in mind will be in um, in materials. Okay, but but the equation is essentially the same sort of equation that appears in in uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, in 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 in, uh, in, uh, in many parts of, of what Ricardo would call mathematical physics, right? The subject that grew out of the uh, contributions of uh, von Neumann. Okay, so I will be talking about thin structures, and I'll just uh, so. Uh, Here is, here is the uh, ra uh, sort of rough contents of my lectures. Okay, uh, it should get a bit. It should be a bit clearer after I draw. Hopefully, won't take long. This this diagram. So basically, what what is the what is the uh, main motivation for studying thin structures? Is this okay? Is this can you can everyone see? So um, so it's replacing replacing uh, a complex problem by by a simpler one. Um, okay. So what 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 uh, do we achieve? As a result, so uh, we get uh, a class of models, class of models um, for um, applied studies, right? So a class of new problems, simpler problems that an, a, a, someone who works in applications can take right away, pull out of the box, and work on those problems rather than starting with a complex problem. Uh, right, and plus the related toolbox, right? And secondly, uh, 
we this helps so replacing a complex problem by a simpler one uh, in, uh, allows to increase uh, the efficiency of, of numerics, right? Uh, because a complex problem may involve lots of degree, will involve lots of degree of freedom, which need to be accounted for in numerics, right? And uh, you, you can greatly reduce the computation time and the whole coding process, implementation, numerical implementation process, by considering this problem, this simpler problem to start with. So, and again, there is a, a, a toolbox of, of error estimates. So this is part of the uh, uh, part of the analysis that we carry out is to provide error estimates that will guarantee that this uh, replacing in the numerical implementation of a complex problem by a simpler one is just is just is not an arbitrary one that that we are actually still close to the original problem in some sense. So so what about the mathematical framework for this? Uh, here, there are several things. Um, uh, that have been looked at. Right? So, uh, and uh, I have decided for purposes of this presentation to split the problems that have been looked at into several classes, right? So the first one is equilibrium problem, and it appears in lecture one there. Uh, so these are problems that uh, are about steady states, right? So uh, there is no time dependence. And the motivating example that I will give, once I'm done with my overview, will be an equilibrium problem. Um, okay, so uh, then and uh, Ricardo Weather has mentioned this already, so there are spectral problems or wave propagation problems and uh, so the uh, a lot of spectral analysis has been done in the context of mathematical physics, but I will argue that uh, that the related techniques can be transferred to uh, applications to material science. Um, then, from a from the sort of operator theoretic perspective, we can actually look at the behavior of the associated operators and the uh, types of convergence. Well, some uh, certain topologies that are associated with operators involved. Um, that will provide uh, that will provide a framework for uh, this uh, error estimates, right? And finally, and this is something I will talk about least in my in in my lectures, uh, 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 partly because Ricardo is going to speak a lot about this scattering problems. So, all of these are, well, in some ways they can be considered to be already as, 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 a, as a particular uh, streams of research or even areas within this larger subject. Okay, but they are of course all interrelated uh, to some extent. And uh, so far, well, m most of the work that, has, that is available is in the, is in the linear context mostly linear, right? This is just to, to uh, prepare you to the fact that we are mostly going to be considering linear problems here. But, however, there is a lot of potential and some work has been done, of course, I mean, a great deal on equilibrium problems, especially uh, in the nonlinear case. So, in the nonlinear case, I would say that at the moment uh, there are two streams one is 
one concerns equilibrium problems and here uh, there are there are some uh, there is a great deal of functional analytical tools as well um, one of the most recent is the so-called gamma gamma convergence of uh, functionals and calculus operations so actually <coughs> the related toolbox is often referred to as calculus operations mm, but I wouldn't want to be as specific here so I want to see it as a wider a wider subject and and even spectral problems but I will put uh, not I, I won't put a solid arrow here because this is this is pretty much still in the uh, process of development to more so than in other directions that I'm described that I have mentioned here okay and so then of course it remains to be seen what else uh, can one, uh, one can do here right but I will mostly focus on these parts and on the linear uh, uh, in on the linear context and here is a rough overview of what I'm planning to talk about so uh, so equilibrium problems is will be the focus of uh, my first lecture then uh, I will mention again mostly in the context of equilibrium problems but also touching upon the spectral 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 questions the uh, in lecture two uh, problems on the so-called singular structures and I will mention different approaches to singular structures. So singular structures are those that, that are obtained by some kind of limiting process from thin structures. So this is maybe worth bearing in mind, this picture. So by thin structures, I mean structures that have some thickness, albeit small, and singular structures are some kind of limiting geometric objects. Then uh, in lecture three, I it's uh, sort of lecture three will be more oriented more towards uh, ex uh, sort of this, the kind of applications in materials that appear sort of in the context of composites and uh, the related uh, techniques, the techniques uh, that have come up in the last 30 or 40 years uh, referred to as the homogenization theory and and so the the, the issues and aspects that are uh, described in the first two lectures they will all be relevant to this particular range of applications to composites and in particular periodic composites and uh, finally I will talk a little bit about in the in the fourth lecture I will talk a little bit about operators the operator approach and how uh, this the material of the first three lectures sort of uh, links to this part and of course there is uh, so the, the, so thereby you can see that there is a there is a already uh, a close connection between between at, this, at least these three, I will mention talk a little bit about this. But as I said, this will be mostly to uh, left to Ricardo, uh, and probably he will talk about it in the context of the Schrödinger equation and the equations of, of quantum mechanics rather than material science. But in materials, you it will be kind of a kind of a, uh, homework for you to try and think how all those things that he will be talking about can be translated in in the language of the equations that the, or transferred to the equations that appear in, in material science. Okay? So with this I will move on to the to some equations. Right? So so you will you, you you will also see quite quite a lot of mathematical tools and they are maybe at first sight they may seem uh, a bit disconnected and to some extent they are still at the moment uh, but uh, and and part of the process part of the pr uh, sort of this research efforts the process of research into the subject is to also uh, understand uh, the relationship between those tools so the tool that I will be using today mostly is uh, just uh, classical weak convergence, weak and strong convergence in uh, in uh, L2 spaces, right? Now I will start with this uh, with the problem uh, uh, for a so a, prob a problem for an elliptic operator just minus Laplacian 
right? Diffusion, diffusion uh, equation with some right hand side that won't depend on uh, the second variable x2. Okay, so uh, let's say this is an L2 function where i is is an interval from minus one half one half. So this is minus one half, one half, and I put uh, the the Dirichlet conditions at the lateral at the at the endpoints of this of the strip. Let's consider a two-dimensional, right? Two-dimensional problem. Of course, you can generalize this. You can consider as a, a, non, a version. It will be straightforward to extend this to to consider a three-dimensional version of this for a road, right? A three-dimensional version of a strip is a road. Okay, so, and I will start with the Neumann problem first. So, uh, what I call, well, Neumann problem, as in the Neumann conditions are going to be set on this uh, uh, sides of this rectangle. Neumann problem. So, uh, u prime equals zero here, and u prime equals zero here. Okay, so, uh, the, the main, I call it omega h, is is this interval i times h i, right? So, uh, so this point, for example, this, this line will be uh, crossing the x2 axis at uh, h half and this at h minus h half, right? So, uh, so the problem is to uh, study the asymptotic behavior um, work out what the asymptotic behavior uh, of uh, uh, the solutions u, which depend on h, uh, in the limit as h goes to zero. Right? So now already this already this question can be addressed or can be can be formulated in different ways depending on the on on the choice of topology. Right? So you you may think about strong, weak topology, or even uh, operator theoretic topology. So, op op sorry, operator norm topology. So you could uh, you could think of this as a, as a, uh, this equation as representing some operator, right? Uh, and well, I won't have time to go into the details of this setup, mm, at least not today. But uh, then. The convergence of solutions is expressed uh, in the operator theoretic terms, let's say, right? As the uh, as the convergence of the resolvents of uh, the associated operators. Uh, right. So, but today I will use the weak and strong convergence methods, the classical methods, to show you that uh, basically my my goal is to demonstrate. That uh, not everything is straight. It's is so straightforward already for simple thin structures like this, and that the answer, of course, you will say, the answer should depend, as uh, mathematicians were very acutely aware of this, on the boundary conditions that we said here. And uh, in the first part, I consider the Neumann boundary conditions, and in the second, I will put the Dirichlet boundary conditions on the on the sides of the strip, and the limit the limit. The, the solutions to these problems are going to behave in different, very different ways as a result. So, <coughs> so first, uh, I will do what people call a priori estimates, right? So, uh, uh, well, first of all, I understand the solution to this problem. So, you u is a solution to this problem if and only if by definition for all for all phi which live in the, what i call h the closure of uh functions uh of products the closure of uh perhaps linear combination right so uh the closure of uh of the linear span, the closure of the linear span of uh, functions like this, right? So uh, psi one 
is in C, not infinity. It's a function of x1, and psi2 is a function in C infinity on the closure of I. So the a function uh, psi2 is, um, uh, well, here I should put, I should put uh, H I, right? Okay, so I want uh, this integral identity to be satisfied for all such functions. So this is uh, the meaning in which I understand the equation. So this is this is standard, right? So for all phi in H. And uh, well. Already at this level, there are different ways to express this. For example, those people who are familiar with operators might think about of a bilinear form uh, associated with this this bilinear form, the expression on the left hand side, and uh, uh, set up a corresponding uh, operator and understand this this equation in an operator sense. So uh, sometimes people say that this is the weak form of the equation. But in fact, it is. It is um, if the data of the problem of f is, uh, if if uh, well, it actually turns out to be equivalent to the strong form here. So for this particular equation, u will actually be a function in H two with two derivatives, and this equation will be satisfied almost everywhere. Uh, but of course, we could also generalize this to uh, problems like this. I'm just not, not going to go into, into these generalizations. Now, what does this describe? This describes some kind of diffusion process, right? You may say. Or you can also come up with, uh, with other examples, like uh, some simple elasticity problem. For example, we in anti-plane shear, when, when you have some slab of an elastic material and uh, the displacements take place in the plane orthogonal to the board, right? are also going to be described by this type of equation. And these boundary conditions in each physical physics application is going to are going to have uh, a certain meaning. So for example in in uh, in uh, uh, in heat conduction uh, it means basically that here you have some kind of fridge the temperature is maintained at at zero and on these sides you have some kind of uh, radiator that maintains uh, the flow that maintains the rate uh, of the flow through the through these parts of the boundary constant to be zero in this case right so um, okay so what are the how how do we get what is the standard approach here the standard uh, in terms of obtaining a priori estimates right so uh, we set set uh, uh, phi test function to be the solution itself right then. Okay, so I'll attach the index H here. So then we have we have this equation, equality. Right? And here we want to estimate below this quantity. And here comes a crucial point. You need to, I mean, the corresponding inequalities where you have the norm of u h in L2 squared with some constant which we need to work out that this constant depends on h and we need to understand how this constant how, what, what the dependence is in order to carry out the symplectic analysis effectively right so these kind of inequalities are called Poincaré inequalities and in this context they are used to uh, provide a priori estimates for solutions Okay, so it turns out. So how do how do uh, find this constant? Any guess? Any anyone knows? So Poincaré constant. Yeah, Poincaré inequality. But how can we determine what this constant is? How how can we actually evaluate it? Well, we can sell. We can solve the spectral problem, right? In this in this slab, and since. Since I didn't assume anything complicated about the coefficients, it's just minus Laplacian, I can use separation of variables here, right? So, uh, so if you, so how do you find CH? 
CH to find CH, you can so you can you can solve this problem. Last boundary conditions, the same boundary conditions, right? As I imposed here. Uh, and uh, for example, you can use the separation of variables. U is say a product of a function of x of x one and 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 x two, right? Separation of variables allows you to uh, uh, determine that the spectrum is the set is the set. Uh, uh, well, this is the result of uh, this is the next, basically, one step away. It's just uh, kind of an, an exercise for you to substitute this this kind of function into the equation, do the separation of variables, and and work out that. Uh, This is the answer, right? Where, where m uh, is any integer but zero, and k is any integer. When we consider the Dirichlet problem, we will have to exclude zero here as well, and this will be important for the analysis. So the Poincaré constant then is just the, lo the smallest eigenvalue simply the smallest eigenvalue that you found. And what is the, sm the smallest eigenvalue here? It's the one that where you set k equal to 0 here, and m equal to 1. And you get 2 pi squared, right? So actually, this, this constant uh, does not depend on h in this case, and it's just 2 pi squared. So this allows us to claim that for a solution, for a sequence of solutions, U H, we have this bound. And and I can I can now uh, well, it's a it's a question of convenience, really. Uh, I prefer to scale now and consider a square. So consider consider a function u tilde h on a square, which is u h times h uh, h times the variable, right? So this function is defined in a square uh, i cross i, and uh, because this function and so in both on both sides the integral has the same uh, simple sort of scaling change of variables, we're going to have a similar estimate for um, and we also know that f, we assume that f does not depend on x2. We're just going to have this bound. So the, the sequence of solutions, scaled sequence of solutions, is just bounded by the norm of f in L2 as a one-dimensional function, function in, in one dimension, with constant 1 over pi, 2 pi squared. So, what does this allow us to do? It allows us to extract a weakly convergent subsequence, first of all. So, there exists a subsequence that converges weakly to something. And that, that's our candidate for the limiting solution. So, and we'll need to... I'll keep the formulation of the problem here. So, uh, so the so U H converge weakly U H tilde converge weakly in L two uh, to some function U. Uh, and actually, here here is one reason why I decided to rescale because if I if I didn't, I would have to consider a sequence of L two spaces that depend on H. But after rescaling, I consider only one L two. For all of them. So these scale functions, they are all defined, while u, h are defined on different strips, and uh, strips that become thinner and thinner, u, h tilde are all defined on a square. Okay, so now the second step, and this is also quite standard in these things, uh, is I'm using, I'm going to use this a priori estimate, oh sorry, this 
there wasn't meant to be a derivative here, of course. So uh, I use this a priori estimate in conjunction with this, with this part to get a bound on the derivatives of the solutions. So, so now uh, I have that the uh, and after rescaling, I end up with the derivative of u h in L two u h tilde in 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 i squared plus one over h squared bounded by the norm of f in L two uh, times the norm of u h tilde. And we already know that this is bounded by 1 over 2 pi squared, the norm of h, uh, and the norm of f. So all together we have this bound. And from this bound, we now know that, that uh, so u, u, h, u, h, uh, the first derivative, and the scaled by 1 over h, Um, by 1 over h, the derivative, the second derivative of u h tilde are bounded in uh, L2 on the square. And so, hence, there are uh, some convergent subsequences as well. Now, uh, well, let's call them somehow. So, u1 h, we already know from the general theory, right? That when we have a uh, weak convergence like this, and the deriv then the derivative converges, the weak derivative converges to the weak derivative of the limit, right? So we can put the derivative of u right away, and uh, this scaled second derivative converges, oh, it should be weak, weak in L2. This converges weakly in L2, to some function v, right? So uh, part of the pro part of the uh, analysis that appears in this in this kind of problems uh, may be to investigate the relationship between v and u, right? They they are often called linking relations or uh, something like that. Um, but uh, right now we will not be concerned with uh, this relationship between v and u. What we are more interested in is the fact <coughs> so is the fact that uh, that the second that the second derivative of u h of u h tilde so, in particular, or rather, I will say, notice that when I write the weak uh, formulation of the fact that um, this is the weak derivative of u2 tilde, right? So, I can write something like this. Uh, and pass to the limit here. So on the one hand, this converges to zero because we're, since one over h u tilde h, the second derivative converges to v, we can say that u uh, h tilde, the second derivative converges to even strongly zero. So this converges to zero, and this converges to minus the integral of uh, u times phi, uh, the second deri the derivative uh, with respect to uh, the second variable of phi. And so hence, uh, the integral of u phi 2 is zero, and this means, so for all phi, for all phi, uh, 
Corel phi now in the closure of a linear combination of functions psi1 of x1 and psi2 of y2, where psi1 is in C0 infinity on the segment and psi2 is in C infinity on the closure of, of i, right? And this means that u uh, does not depend so this implies that u by the fundamental theorem of calculus operations this implies that u does not depend on x2 so actually this partial derivative with respect to x1 is the is the normal ordinary or ordinary derivative of u so finally so in summary what do we have we have u h tilde converges weakly to u, uh, which is a function of x1. And the first derivative of u h tilde converges weakly in L2 to the derivative of this function. <coughs> so now in the weak formulation to the problem, so, so I recall the weak formulation. Uh, integral of u1 by 1 plus, and I will write it in the scale coordinates. The scale version of it. So the integrals are over the square. So we take phi take phi, remember phi was in the closure of functions that are products of functions of x1 and x2 only. So I take phi that depends on x1 only. So uh, it was called psi1, I think, right? So psi2 is 1. And uh, we end up with, well, since psi does not, since phi does not depend on x2, this term vanishes, right? And uh, we have this. Now, this can be written as simply the integral, since this does not depend on x2. This is just the integral over i. And this by this weak convergence statement converges by this weak convergence statement. So by this double star converges as h goes to zero to u prime. Oh, there is a psi one prime here, right? And here I can also put here I had the integral over the square. And here, since these functions don't depend on x2, I can put the interval i. So this is this is the limit equation for u. So, so u solves in the weak sense, and we know that once it solves it in the weak sense, it solves it in the strong sense as well. At least for this this kind of equation for minus Laplacian, we have minus u double prime equals f. So for this problem. The functions u converge, u h converge to a function u that solves the diffusion equation uh, as if it was just on a line. Okay, so now I will leave it to you. I was gonna uh, uh, go through the details, but uh, but uh, I think uh, time is getting short, so I'll leave it to you as an exercise to show that uh, uh, show that that uh, u at 0 equals u, uh, u at minus 1 half equals u at 1 half equals 0. So all the information that you have so far is sufficient. Basically, this, this weak convergence of the derivatives is sufficient to uh, also get the boundary values of u uh, at the endpoints of this interval to be 0. Right. So the, the, 
the zero boundary values here are preserved in the limit. So this is this is the full formulation of the limit problem here. So and how much time do I have? <laughs> so uh, the second the second problem I was going to talk about is the Dirichlet, and uh, here the limit is going to satisfy a different equation. So, and, well, I guess the, our aim is to then give it some physical interpretation. Is to say that once you have a, a, a thin structure with a, once you have a thin structure, you, th you should think carefully about the boundary conditions that you have and replace that structure, replace the corresponding equation, diffusion equation, either by that, well, this is easier to solve than this, right? Or uh, by uh, by another equation, depending on the boundary conditions. Well, uh, this is so. It's just a message that uh, boundary conditions are crucial in the in the analysis of the problem. Sometimes disregarded by uh, people in uh, by physicists, let's say. So uh, I have come across this many times. So the uh, they uh, tend not to worry about the boundary conditions, but it's it's. Uh, it can it it's uh, it can be dangerous, right? So, so the second the second uh, problem is the Dirichlet problem. Uh, so I have Dirichlet boundary conditions here, and what would we expect? What would you expect in this problem from the on physical grounds? If you talked about diffusion, so you have you have a fridge standing now everywhere on all sides what do you expect for the solution to do those of you who took uh, courses in uh, classical pde should know what happens in this problem well you kind of expect that the solution that the solution eventually vanishes right so if say you consider uh, if you consider the full time dependent problem for the diffusion equation with time, and you took this as boundary conditions, then the body would eventually cool down to zero. This doesn't happen to to the Neumann problem, of course. So and this fact manifests itself in the limit solution behaving in a completely different way here, namely it goes to zero in L two strongly in L two as h goes to zero. So, so the original problem is the differential expression is the same, but now we have these boundary conditions. And where does the key point in the analysis gonna the key difference is gonna appear? The first key difference in the between the uh, Neumann problem and the Dirichlet problem. It's gonna appear in the Poincaré inequality, right? Because when you study the spectral, pro when you want to work out what the Poincaré constant is, you will need to use the separation of variables, for example, to find the eigenvalues of the problem in the strip, but you have changed the boundary conditions. So now, so the spectral problem is the same as far as the differential equation is concerned, but with new boundary conditions, well, Dirichlet, right? Dirichlet boundary conditions and this means that the spectrum the spectrum is uh, is uh, given by the sequence same sequence as before but with with um, with one with the with one of the elements excluded so both m and k are uh, uh, do not take our reals oh sorry are integers excluding zero and this means that that for the a priori estimates we're gonna get something different right so we're gonna first write the same thing as before but here Below, I'm going to estimate this now by, I'm going to have to estimate this by 1 plus 1 over h squared, the norm of u. 
in L2 square. So these are all norms in uh, omega in L2 and omega H. And of course this is still as before. So you can see that that uh, you can immediately see that the solutions converge strongly. So this is converge strongly to zero in L2. So uh, this, okay, so I'll, I'll, I first write the version in omega h, and then I introduce, I introduce again, I find it convenient to go back, to go, go to a fixed domain, right? So, so let's introduce this notation then, then in terms of these functions we have, uh, we have this estimate. And and so this this converges to zero, right? You know, too strongly. So, but but uh, importantly, not only do we get from this analysis, from just spectrum, from just analyzing the spectrum of the problem, not only do you get the fact that U H converges strongly to zero, you also get the correct scaling that you need to obtain, you need to impose in order to see what it actually, once you scale it, what it converges, well, in order to continue analyzing the problem, right? You see that, that the correct scaling, is one over h squared, right? So this, this object is now bounded. In fact, it is bounded again by 2 pi squared, the norm of f. And so this object now converges weakly in L2 to something. And that's the function that we need to work with and find the limit equation on. So hence, hence up to a subsequence. Oh, I forgot to mention that we always extract, extract a subsequence, right? When we have a bounded in L2, we extract a, a, bound, a sequence bound in, bounded in L2, we extract a weakly convergent subsequence. But once you have determined that the limit solves a problem, and that problem has a unique solution, you know that the whole sequence must converge to that function. Because if it didn't, then you would extract a subsequence that is far away from the solution, from the limit solution. And that would lead you to a contradiction by extracting a subsequence from that subsequence and arguing that it must converge to the limit. So the whole sequence must converge. So the same here, it's not going to be relevant in the end. We, the whole sequence is going, to be, is going to be convergent to the limit. But at the moment, we can only claim that there is a subsequence converging. Right? So hence, uh, there is a subsequence uh, which I am still going to denote by the same letter H for the reasons I've just explained, because in the end, the whole sequence is going to converge. Weakly in L2 to something. Well, uh, I'm going to call this W. And I'm going to write, now derive an equation on W. Okay, so we're almost, well, we're not far from it now, right? So... So what do we have? So this Okay. Uh, so let's look let's look at uh, at this bound. So So consider consider triple star. So we have this right hand side, right? So we have UH and I'm going to write it in terms of uh, the scaled variables. So that's why you have tilde over your h plus one over h squared is bounded by the norm of f in L two on the interval. 
times uh, the norm of the norm of u h in l two, and this is this is we just worked it out. It's bounded by this, right? So it's bounded by uh, by uh, two pi h squared, the norm of f in l two on i. So, and there are squares here. So, if I divide through by h squared now, what do I have? So, this gives me 1 over h, the first derivative of uh tilde squared, plus 1 over h squared. You see, again, the derivatives in different directions are scaled in different ways. Uh, is bounded by 2 pi squared, the norm of f in L2 squared. So, and now I'm going to be arguing about convergences con uh, of these sequences. So, so there is a, so up to a subsequence, so hence, hence, up to a subsequence, uh, 1 over h, u tilde h, converges to some v1, weakly in L2. And 1 over h squared converges weakly in L2 to v2. Okay, so, and, and in particular, so in this in particular implies that you that the first derivative of u h tilde converges strongly this was weak convergence but because we have one the factor one over h here this converges strongly to zero in l2 and finally i want to find the relationship between v2 the linking relation between v2 and uh, the limit and this w so relation between w and v2 how and how do we do this we we write a weak, weak form we write the, the the formulation of the fact that uh, uh, that this is the weak derivative of u of u h tilde right so we have 1 over h squared okay i'll put it here so 1 over h squared u h phi 2. This is true for all phi in C0 infinity now, because we have the Dirichlet conditions everywhere. We can just take C0 infinity on, uh, on the square. This converges to, because of this, it converges to V2 phi. And this converges, because of that, to W phi 2. So this is true for all phi in C0 infinity. So it means that uh, it means that uh, V2 is the weak derivative of W with respect to the second variable. So basically this is it. This is just the definition of the fact that V2 is W2. Right? Yeah. And now, and now we finally take, go back to the weak formulation again of the original problem and pass to the limit in it. Right? So we have the integral of u1 h uh, phi 1 plus the integral of 1 over h, and I wish to put it here again, 2 phi 2 equals the integral of f phi. And I just use, I just use the facts that I have. I have accumulated, so the weak derivative of u h tilde with respect to the first coordinate goes to zero strongly in L1. So this goes to zero. This goes to the to v2, which is the weak derivative of w with respect to the second variable. And so I get a weak formulation for uh, for a problem on w. 
And as you can see, it's a, it's a diffusion equation, but in the direction orthogonal to the axis of this, of this strip. So it goes across. The diffusion takes place across, uh, uh, across the, the strip. And again, you, you are welcome to check you have all the facts that you have are sufficient to show that W uh, at um, now W is a function of two variables, of course. So in this in this problem, x1 should be viewed as a parameter. So for each x1, this prob function solves the diffusion equation with respect to x2. And uh, W at so. Uh, so as a function of x1 uh, at uh, points minus one half in x2 and one half these boundary conditions this function must take zero values so you can also obtain this by from the fact that you have this convergence of derivatives it's enough to kind of uh, keep the boundary values intact okay so I guess I will stop here. I, I haven't managed to talk about one more thing today, but maybe I'll move it to the second lecture. Uh, it's uh, to see how more exciting, even more exciting things. It's already exciting enough, I think. You have two different answers to seemingly, well, very similar problems to start with. Uh, but then I would like to kind of also give you uh, a, a, a quick view of what uh, this kind of analysis would look like in the case of uh, vector problems. So this was a scalar problem for diffusion. Let's say if you thought of this as some kind of elastic body and you consider the polarization where it cannot be reduced to a scalar equation but rather has to be treated as a vector problem with two components of the displacement of an elastic field, then uh, the analysis becomes more, even more interesting and there are some uh, deep mathematical challenges there as well that go beyond, well, that uh, um, present substantial difficulties compared to what we have done here. Okay, so maybe I will, I will start my second lecture with that. Okay.